going to have some fun. We're going to have fun yeah. tonight. And we're going to just share um, our experience of growing up Amish. Um, Priscilla and I both were born in very conservative, uh, old order Amish communities. And uh, as time evolved and as we were married, things changed and we're not very traditional. We're, I'd say we're called non-traditional at this point, but we still value our heritage and our roots mm -hmm. very much. Um, and so we thought we'd share a little bit with you about how we grew up, what it, what it was like to grow up Amish, and what it was like to grow up without electricity, uh, with with running water, which means you have to run and get it, um, <laughs> and no indoor plumbing, um, no indoor toilet. Is the way I grew up until I was around 12 or so. So mm -hmm. let's start in. My beautiful wife Priscilla. I'm Joas. We have five wonderful children, um, ages four through 13, and they're tucked in bed. And now is our time to make a little movie about our life. So go ahead, Priscilla, tell us where you, where you were born and tell us a little bit about your story. Okay, so this, I actually have still some of my old traditional Amish clothes, so I wanted to show you. So this is my, this is a shawl that we would wear to go to church. We put it on, put it around us and just use like a big safety pin to close it. And here is this cap. We, we called it, uh, in German, we called it kappa or a cop which means cap. So, and it was very, you can see in the back, it was really, uh, it was a real skill to be able to make these. I never was, I never was good at it, but what my oldest sister would make them. And then also this was our bonnet that we would wear, we would put on to go to church. Let's see if it still fits. So there you go. Isn't she cute? <laughs> so cute. Cute little Amish girl. <laughs> I was born in Missouri and just, uh, I was just a little, still a little baby when my parents moved out. It was, in Missouri, it was a very um, conservative Amish community. There was no running water in the house unless they had like this pump. Right, a hand pump. A hand pump thing. No indoor bathroom. It was just a, a outhouse, and um, but I don't remember much about uh, living there. But we moved to Pennsylvania, and then a little later we moved to Michigan, and that's where I grew up. How old were you when you moved to Pennsylvania, out of Missouri? I was just—I don't think I even was one. So no just, memories of, of Missouri. Mm -mm. And then, how old were you when you moved to Michigan? Seven years old. I was seven when we moved to Michigan, and I lived there until I was 18. So, that was my childhood mm -hmm. home, Michigan was. Yeah, and then I, I was born uh, in Montana. My parents moved from uh, a large community in LaGrange, northern Indiana, LaGrange, Indiana, uh, where a lot of my relatives still live. And uh, my parents moved in 1974 to a little unknown place called Rexford, Montana. And it's just, our home was one mile from the Canadian border. We lived 30 miles from town. And the only way to get to town, we never took a horse and buggy, it was just too far, uh, as we'd hire a driver to go to town. And we hardly ever went to town. I would go to town, you know, maybe once a year or so. Just didn't go to town. I grew up, you know, out in the, in the sticks. Uh, we were very poor, I was born there. Actually, I was born in the town of Whitefish in the hospital. Uh, and then, uh, I'll tell you a little funny story about that. I, we're we're going to interject some stories because I know we like stories, and I'm sure you guys like stories. So I'll tell you a little bit. This is some of the culture. We're going to share with you some of the culture of the Amish. So we love the Amish. First of all, we're just going to tell you that we love the Amish people. They're, they're our heritage. They're our culture. Um, there are people. Yeah, there are people. And and I have, uh, years ago I read a quote in a book that says, if you don't know uh, where you come from, you'll never know where you're going. Mm -hmm. And so that's been very important to me. Anyways, as part of the culture, um, I was the youngest of eight children, um, eight living children. My mom had 10 children. The first one was a stillborn, and I had a nine-year-old brother that passed away, both in horse and buggy accidents. Um, but when mom brought me home from the hospital, the neighbors came over and said, 
you know, mom's bringing something home from the hospital to my older brothers and sisters, which uh, my, my next oldest sibling, uh, my sister is six and a half years older than I am, and my brother is 10, 10 years older. So he was 10, 10 and a half years older than me, and my other next sister was 12 years older than I was, you know, since I was just born. And uh, the neighbors asked him, you know, your mom's bringing something home from the hospital. Can you guess what it is? <laughs> and they didn't know what mom was bringing home from the hospital. They didn't know she was pregnant. So uh, Elvie, my brother Elvie guessed a new bike <laughs> and a pony, you know. So anyways, they were really surprised when I came from home from the hospital, not even knowing that, that mom was expecting a baby. So that's, that's pretty normal in the uh, Amish culture. So we lived in a, in a little uh, home up by the Canadian border that my dad and my brothers built, and that's where I grew up. So tell us a little bit more, Priscilla, about like your school and how that, tell me a little, us a little bit more about that. Your growing up years in Michigan. Okay, yeah, and uh, in Michigan, just growing up as an Amish girl, it was, there was a lot of work. Children worked a lot, but there was also a lot of hard play and um, I remember spending many hours out in the mulberry trees. There were mulberry trees in Michigan and as children after the work was done or in the afternoons when we had time, we would run up to the mulberry trees and sit in, in there and eat mulberries. In the branches. In the branches, yep, <laughs> up in the branches. And, um, but as far as just everyday life, we had there's just, for the girls, it was housework. We did uh, sweeping, mopping, washing windows. We learned how to, we learned how to clean house. We, le we learned the basics of, <clears throat> of keeping a home. We learned how to cook, sew, and can. Tell us how you did, um, how you wash your clothes. Well, we had this. Uh, There's no electricity, so. We had this, well, we had a generator. Uh, uh, we used a generator. You did, okay. At, at that time. Okay. I don't remember before that, but we had okay. like this, <clears throat> but it was this ringer. Ringer well, washer. Ringer so it was washer. electric. I mean, it was, you plug, you started a motor. Yeah. And then you plugged it in and it was mm -hmm. a ringer washer. Okay. Was, and you, so you put the, the laundry through this right. ring, Maytag, ringer. Maytag yeah. ringer washer. So yeah. the way that I grew up until my mom, even just until a few years, I just a few years ago, matter of fact, she liked her Maytag ringer washer and we had a little Honda motor with a belt. <laughs> We'd start the motor, you know, exhaust on the basement, try to pipe it out, but it always was exhausty. And this ringer washer on a belt, a little Honda motor, and she would, you know, run all her clothes through the, mm -hmm. through the Maytag washer and then rinse them in the tub and then squeeze, run them through again to squeeze them, then hang them out on the line. Now my mom and my parents are both uh, in their 80s, mm -hmm. um, so we finally insisted she get a an electric washer and dryer, which <laughs> she does use that now. Yeah, we always hung all the wash out on the line, and and um, I'll still say there's nothing that smells better than fresh laundry from mm -hmm. the line. It smells so good. Yeah, and folded it, and I came from. There was nine children. Uh, I had eight siblings, and so we had loads of laundry. And, and how often did you do laundry? Twice a week, everything, yeah. Mondays and Thursdays or something? Something like that, yeah, so, yeah. Okay. And school, um, the school was just, we, we, it was a one-room schoolhouse, and it was from grade one to eight. We always had uh, an art class and a German class, mm -hmm. and uh, by the way, um, I grew up Swiss, so I spoke a Swiss dialect, plus Swiss I- Swiss German. Swiss German dialect, plus I learned another German dialect. My, my yeah. dialect of German, yeah. which is Deutsch, but mm -hmm. people have coined it Dutch, which is not Dutch, Dutch yeah. but you, you probably know it as Pennsylvania Dutch, but it actually came as Deutsch, which means German, and uh, came from the Pennsylvania, so it's a it's a German dialect, yeah. um, actually called Schwabisch, which they still speak in Germany. Um, and my brother actually has visited Germany, where, and he was able to communicate exactly uh, in our language, in our uh, 
Schwäbisch dialect that we speak. Mm -hmm. So yes, Priscilla grew up Swiss German, I grew up Schwäbisch mm -hmm. uh, with the Pennsylvania Deutsch Dutch um, dialect. Yeah, and then we also learned English, mm -hmm. so almost three languages right. in a way. So, yeah. So we still speak because there's fewer uh, Swiss people in our community, so we have chosen to speak, to teach that to our children. Mm -hmm. uh, but they have a lot of cousins and friends that speak the Schwäbisch, mm -hmm. so they also speak that, and then of course they speak English as well. So our children are what we call trilingual or something, but they, uh, it's funny because they have kind of developed their own language and so we have to help them with that because <laughs> they've come up with these words mm -hmm. that don't exist, which is kind of funny between English and uh, German, like Jinglish or something, and Swinglish, <laughs> I don't know what it is. Um, anyways, yeah, and I also grew up in a one-room schoolhouse, um, uh, grades one through eight, and um, we always, every, you know, ran, ran to school, never took a school bus, uh, or anything to school. Uh, school was always less than, a, for me, was always less than a mile away, about a mile or a lot less. And so I always ran to school and ran back home. Um, and when I was in third grade, I remember uh, waking up in the middle of the night and the neighbor was beating on her door, said, Aura, Aura, which is my dad, wake up, wake up, the schoolhouse is on fire. And uh, I remember running in my PJs with my sisters down through the woods and during the dark, it was like 4 a.m., and I, we watched the whole schoolhouse cave in, just the whole walls and the roof and everything just implode. And uh, um, so that was, that was quite amazing. Uh, and we, didn't, we built another schoolhouse then uh, a few weeks, about six weeks later, we, uh, we started school again. It was kind of towards the end of the season, so I believe we started school earlier that year. Our school typically goes even now from the beginning of September through the end of April. And there's only about one week off total during the whole school year. And the reason that we've chosen, the Amish have chosen that is so uh, when the children go to school, they're focused on school and then they have all the way from May, June, July, and August, four months to spend at home with their parents, apprenticing, working on the farm or the, the family business. So that's a really good way of you know, for us, it's worked out well where the children are in school, they're doing their studies, and then, then they're working with their dad or their mom uh, during the summer. So mm -hmm. that's how we do that. I'll tell you a little story um, that I thought that I thought about just now, and that was when I was. Um, uh, we always had, we always went everywhere in the with the horse and buggy. And when we say buggy, we didn't we didn't have a buggy. We had, we called a spring wagon. It was an open, um, an open wagon. So it had like a seat at the front, a seat at the back, and then it, you know, you would classify it almost like a truck <laughs> because you could carry things in the back with two seats. So it could, it could hold like six people plus room for like stuff in the back. Uh, so an open spring wagon. But so we'd go throughout the community uh, in the West Kootenai in the Rexford, Montana there in that uh, open spring wagon to church and different places wherever we needed to go. We had some faithful horses that would always take us there. But I remember uh, one evening coming home from um, from church in the evening. Uh, on every Sunday evening, there would be what we call a hymn singing, and all the community would gather, uh, and there would be a dinner together, and then we would sing for an hour or so, hour and a half, and uh, just sing. First, it was usually sing German songs for 30 minutes, and then sing uh, English songs for the, the remainder of the time. But this particular evening was in winter time. I was about eight or nine years old. I remember, and uh, we had a horse named Rufus, and we took the sleigh to the singing. Uh, but on the way home, we took kind of took a shortcut through the woods. It was like an old trail, and there was this Kelly hump, this bump in the trail, and something happened that that I don't know what happened, but the sleigh ended up overturning, and I remember I fell out, and there was like I had probably think two of my two or three of my siblings along with me, mm. my dad and my mom. Dad was driving the horse and the sleigh, and this thing overturned and threw us out as we went over this Kelly hump, and mom was stuck underneath the sleigh. And I always think of the horrific thing that could have happened had the horse panicked and taken off, dragging the sleigh and mom underneath, it had been awful. But the horse was a good horse, and somehow he, dad was able to hold him or something, and you know the, sha the shafts that the horse was in was all twisted up and everything, but the horse didn't run away, and we were able to tip the sleigh back up, up, and mom got out of there. 
So, uh, you know, bumps and bruises, but yeah. just, you know, there's so many things that happen. And like I mentioned, you know, I, I had a brother that I never knew at nine years old, fell off the back of a wagon and hit his head on the pavement. Um, mm -hmm. And he passed away as well as uh, my oldest sibling that was a stillborn when mom was still pregnant, she fell out of a runaway horse and buggy and, uh, it, and that causes the, the baby to, to die inside her. So yeah, mom and dad have known, you know, multiple deaths in her family, their family. Uh, so the horse and buggies are, you know, it's always, it's all, it's a dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. A good place to grow up. I think the Amish, it's a very, very good culture as far as growing up in that culture about family and, and work ethics. There's many things that are not good about the Amish. Um, one, you know, one of them being just another religion. Um, but there's many good hearts, many good people, and uh, many of them, they all want the truth. They all want to know the Lord. They all want to follow, uh, follow to the best that they know how. There's just, um, you know, a number of mis information that they uh, are not fully aware of God's love mm -hmm. for them and, and and that type of thing. So we're thankful that God has brought us to a place where we've, you know, know his love and mm -hmm. and believe that you know, he came on the cross for us and, and many things like that. So mm -hmm. very thankful for that. Good memories that I have growing up is life was in a way slower pace because you mm -hmm. didn't have vehicles. You didn't have no media. Yeah, you didn't have phones. You you just you, you were very creative. You became very creative, and um, I remember us children and youth. We would have many skating parties. We'd be out in the pond skating in the winter time, and um, like there was a town about seven miles from us, and that had a Walmart. And sometimes we would literally take the whole day, take the buggy and go to Walmart, uh, the horse and buggy, and uh, take the whole day to go to Walmart. And, you know, we eat out, because we rarely ate out. And, and fast food. Yeah, and, <laughs> and so that was so special. We'd go to McDonald's sometimes, and just uh, walk around in Walmart, and sometimes, yeah, that was just, those were good memories. Because we us. never got to go to town. Yeah, right we yet. never got, right. we didn't get to do that much of it, mm -hmm. so. Tell us about some of the first jobs you had or did when you were growing up, as far as outside the home. Right, uh, a lot of Amish girls will mostly stay at home and just help with the family farm or help in the house, or sometimes they will uh, become a teacher or, um, you know, be a babysitter or mm -hmm. stuff like that. But um, my dad was a little different in that way. He, he encouraged us to go out and get jobs. <laughs> and so it, at 14 years old, uh, the first job I had was picking asparagus. And um, it was behind a wagon and uh, the owner drove the tractor and we lay on the wagon and picked, picked asparagus. We got really, our backs got really tired. But that was my first job, and then, uh, then I started working um, at this guy's fruit farm. He had, he had a fruit farm where we cut up a whole bunch of different fruit and put it in packages, and it sold in grocery stores like or fresh fruit, fresh fruit ready to eat. And so I worked there for two years, and then after that, I worked at a harness shop at a it was. We sew racehorse harnesses, so uh, I learned how to had these big commercial sewing yeah machines. commercial sewing machines and so I I worked there probably another two years and after that I had um, I had a teacher job where I taught first grade class and then after that I worked at a bakery and that was my favorite job. I loved baking. So. And she was good at it too. <laughs> yeah, so I, my dad started uh, Metal Arc Log Homes when I was, at that time it was called Kootenai Log Homes, um, when I was, uh, the year I was born essentially, a few years before I was born, my brothers actually built a little log cabin out in the woods 
and that kind of birthed the idea of, of a log home business. Uh, but in 1980, uh, Dad started the company the year I was born, actually. And uh, so I grew up all my life uh, building log homes, so I still am. Uh, my dad is retired uh, out of Metal Arc Log Homes. Uh, we sold the business when we moved from Rexford, Montana to where we currently live in Libby, Montana. And we restarted another company here now. It's called Metal Arc Log Homes. Um, so I grew up, I remember some of my first memories were when I was six years old, peeling logs with a draw knife, which we still do that today. Uh, fortunately, I, I don't need to do that anymore, but uh, that's, a, that's a hard job. But the reason I remember doing that at six years old is because I got a very bad sunburn that day. Uh, so I just, during the summer, I would operate, um, when I was about nine, uh, nine years old, I started running the crane to set the log, the log houses. Now you're probably thinking crazy, nine year old, but that was just what we did. Um, all us children worked. My sisters ran the cranes. And that was like my first thing I could do that I was, you know, and I was good at it. I ran the crane for years and years, so I was sick and tired of running the crane. Um, it was a mental, mental job, uh, but it was good. It was good for me to do that. Peel logs for a lot of time. I've done everything uh, in Metal Art Log Homes, but growing up that was, just, it was working hard is what we did after school. We'd do our chores, which included, at one time we had 100 chickens that we uh, raised for eggs, and we always had a cow or two. Um, so did the doing the chores, and then I always would have to go help run the crane until the you know end of work day. Uh, and then of course during the summertime, that was just, we didn't have to start early necessarily. Like um, usually I think around eight or nine o'clock I would go back to the mill, but then I would have to work all day running the crane, and it, it, it was really tiring for you know a nine-year-old. Um, and I, I'm sure I, I played more than I remember, but uh, nonetheless, that was something that was just expected of us was to work. Yeah. And then uh, some of our hobbies uh, growing up, I, I was always a, more, I guess, of the entrepreneurial type. I, so talking about jobs, let's talk about that, our money, where did our money go to? In a typical Amish community, uh, family, even nowadays, in the way we grew up, you're, the children are just expected to work in the family business and therefore don't receive wages. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you uh, turn a certain age, then you know maybe you get a little spending money here and there, or whatever. But you typically just uh, you you're part of the family business until you reach a certain age of 20, 21 years old, and then you are able to receive a full wage and start saving your money in that way. Um, so I always worked in the family business, so that means if I wanted extra spending money, um, I had to make my own money. So I did all kinds of little jobs, and one thing I always did was raise rabbits. And I, I always had rabbits, and that's something I enjoyed. <laughs> I, I raised rabbits, butcher rabbits, I raised ostriches for some time, uh, raised exotic birds, pheasants, and When I met him, he had this, all, these huge cages of all these different birds. and. Yeah. I love birds, I still do actually, but mm -hmm. yeah, exotic pheasants and those type of things. And then I did taxidermy work for a while. I started my own little taxidermy business and mounted deer and <laughs> elk and stuff like that. So that's, yeah, always did little odds and ends and tried to, you know, have little businesses for myself. He had so many hobbies, but he was so creative. So one thing, every time I had, I had a, a lot of hobbies going into marriage. <laughs> so. <laughs> Every time I had a child, I had to lay down about two hobbies. So now I'm down to like what? <laughs> Hardly any hobbies Not anymore. Any. <laughs> <laughs> my hobbies are now my wife and my family. So yeah, oh, it's very good. I hope he can get into it, which he just did. He mounted a deer with his with Ethan. Yeah, so. Ethan and Justin and I mounted yeah. Ethan's deer recently. I just made a video of that too. That was kind of fun mm -hmm. doing that. So anyways. To conclude, we just want to give you a little snapshot of, of our life growing up. There's so many more things we could yeah, spend. I feel like there's an hour we could so spend talking more. about, mm -hmm. you know, uh, oh, I mean, just trying to, uh, so many different things. We pushed a lawnmower, for example. We pushed a lawnmower that had blades. Okay, you know that Home Alone movie where the guy, <laughs> <laughs> there's a Home Alone movie where the guy is like pushing this lawnmower through the attic and mows the guy's hair off. Okay, it was one of those lawnmowers. You push the lawnmower. There was and, no motor. Yeah, it no, was it was just, manually driven. Yeah. The wheels drove the blades, mm -hmm. and it was hard work. You had to push and, and then stop, push and stop. So some 
Amish people would just put their horses in the lawn so they'd yeah. eat up the grass. <laughs> yeah. So you never had manicured lawns yeah. hardly when, you yeah. know, so just a lot of things. Um, yeah, I, I, we got running water and uh, uh, propane lights in our home when I was around 10 years old, I believe. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we always went to the outhouse and uh, we had to go about uh, a quarter of a mile and we had dug a well and then we had to start a motor which pumped the water about a half a mile went up to a tank, a large holding tank, which then gravity fed it down to our house. Uh, so we did that for action until the time we moved, I believe at about 12 years old. Um, so we always had to do that several, every couple of days we started the motor and pumped water. So yeah, just a lot of, lot of things we could talk about life growing up Amish, but uh, it was it was a good a good safe place to grow up for for myself. For it was. us, yeah, yeah, it was. It's I not know for in everybody. Some Amish communities, it's not. Yeah, you know? there's the Amish range mm -hmm. from very conservative to you know driving cars um, on the other end. So you know, um, there's it's very different. Each community has its own set of uh, rules and and. Uh, you know good things about it and, and mm -hmm. maybe not so good things about it but here's the thing we're all people and we all struggle with the same issues everybody else struggles with and um, so yeah there's a lot of difference you know it depends on how you grew up but we, we had good lives growing up I think yeah. you know it was a safe place mm -hmm. it was a good place um, yep so next time we might make another video of how we met how we met and uh, maybe a l our love story you can leave a comment down below if you want us to do that. Yep. So we, we might not tell you. until you tell us to. <laughs> so yeah, if you want to, if you want to hear more about us, I hope this was interesting to you. I'm not sure uh, how interesting it is. <laughs> it's uh, old news to us, but yeah. Um, yeah, we just want to give you a snapshot of our lives and tell you a little bit more about us. 